All right, uh, always like to back you up, uh, you know, less so each time, but uh, we're in this section, the central section of the book of Hebrews, which is an exposition on the high priesthood of Christ, runs from chapter 4, verse 14, through chapter 10, verse 18, and in chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, we see that Jesus was appointed high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, and Melchizedek is a type. I spent a lot of time talking about that. He is a type of eternal, non-Levitical priest. Jesus is the fulfillment of that type. So he he mentions, he says, Jesus was appointed uh, a high priest on the order of Melchizedek. And then he takes kind of a detour. He has a section of exhortation and warning. And that goes down through the end of chapter 6. And at the beginning of chapter 7, he picks back up with the subject of Melchizedek. And in chapter 7, verses 1 through 10... He explains the superiority of the Melchizedekian priesthood. And then in chapter 7, verses 11 through 28, he expounds on the superiority of Jesus, who's our eternal Melchizedekian high priest. Chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, he identifies the, the main point, he says, of what he's been driving at. Namely, that Christians have the kind of high priest he has described. We have that high priest. You remember the larger context is... He's writing because it seems there are Christians, I'm saying in a probably predominantly Jewish house church or house churches in Rome, who are in danger of returning to some form of Judaism. So he's writing to them and he's warning them of what he's doing. The note that he sounds continually is Christ is better. He's superior. There's nothing like him. So why in the world are you going to turn to the lesser, to the inferior? And that's where you go any time you turn from Christ. Whether it be back to your prior religion, whether it be back to the world, any time you turn from Jesus Christ, you are going from the greatest, the ultimate, to something inferior, something lesser. So that's the context. But he says, he identifies in chapter 8, verses 1 and and 2, He says the main point of what he's been saying, that Christians do have this kind of high priest. We have one who's sinless, eternal, sympathetic, and one who was appointed with an oath. And this high priest, Jesus Christ, he ministers not in an earthly sanctuary. He doesn't minister in an earthly sanctuary, but in heaven itself where he sits at the right hand of God. Then in 8, chapter 8, verses 3 through 6, he explains that Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant And in conjunction with that covenant, he obtained a heavenly ministry that's superior to the earthly ministry of the Levitical priest. Because you remember here, they're they're thinking about going back here, some pull of their former life in Judaism, and there are all kinds of pressures that I've talked about that may be accounting for that pressure to turn. There are always pressures to turn. Okay, so you don't sit here and say, well, we don't have that kind of thing. We're not being persecuted. Uh, There's not a great persecution looming on the horizon, so it's not relevant. Of course it's relevant. There are always things pulling a Christian from zeal and commitment and trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Always things pulling you. Okay, and so this is very relevant because he says, just look at him and focus on him. Because he is the greatest one. Chapter 8, okay, then 3 through 6, he's the mediator of this new covenant. He received a a ministry that's superior to to the earthly ministry of the Levitical priest. And he says this new covenant is a better covenant in that it it was enacted or founded on better promises. And then in chapter 8, verses 7 through 13, he elaborates on the superiority of the new covenant. Okay, he says this covenant's founded on better promises. It's superior. He elaborates on that superiority of the new covenant. In chapter 8, verses 7 through 13. Then the focus of chapter 9, verse, chapter 9, verse 1, through chapter 10, verse 18, the focus there is on the superiority of the new covenant offering. The superiority of Christ's sacrifice. Chapter 9, verses 1 through 10, we looked at last week. He discusses the pattern of old covenant worship. And then in chapter 9, verses 11 and 12, he introduces the superiority of Christ's offering for sin. Okay, explaining that he entered once for all time into the holy of holies, into the very presence of God in heaven by his own blood, by his sacrificial death on the cross. And then in chapter 9, verses 13 through 22, those verses, they speak of the superiority of Christ's blood. And we looked last week at verses 13 and 14. 
I want to read those again. I'll recap how I see the main thrust of those verses, and then we'll pick up reading verses 15 through, through 22. So let me read that. 13 and 14, chapter 9, he says, For if the blood of goats and bulls, with sprinkling ashes of a heifer, sanctifies those who've been defiled for, for the purity of the flesh, if that blood does that, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works in order to minister to the living God. He says, look, given that the blood of bulls and goats was accepted by God as purification for people, albeit purification, see, at an external level, something that restored a formal degree of fellowship. Okay, it, it did that. It restored a formal degree of fellowship but it left a barrier to intimacy through this lingering sense of guilt. He says, if the blood of animals was by God's will sufficient for that purpose, well then how much will the blood of Christ utterly purify? See, if it did that, how much will the blood of Christ utterly purify, purify even our consciences from sin so that we may serve God in a greater state of intimacy? Okay, that's what I see as the main point of that. Then he says in... Okay, um, this is a section 15 to 22 that I, it really goes 13 to 22, but I had to bust it up, and this looks like a good way to bust it up. 15 to 17, then we'll read 18 to 22 in a minute. Verse 15, chapter 9, he says, And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, in order that a death having occurred for redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, those having been called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a will, it is necessary to establish the death of the one who made it. For a will is effective in the case of dead persons, since it is never in force when the one who made it is living. Okay, the writer says in verse 15 that Jesus is the one through whom God's new covenant was brought into effect. And it was brought into effect, he says, in order that those who've been called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. See, the new covenant was necessary for people to receive the promised eternal inheritance because the forgiveness available under the old covenant was based on what? It was based on the coming sacrifice of Christ. That's what the forgiveness was based on. See, God forgives sins under that covenant on credit, so to speak, because Christ, who is the truly effective, the truly efficacious atoning sacrifice, Christ is that sacrifice to which all the shadows of the Old Covenant point. Okay, the forgiveness under the Old Covenant was on credit, so to speak, because Christ, the truly efficacious sacrifice, was coming into the world. You see, He was coming and that's why there is this forgiveness. If Christ had not in fact become the sin offering, okay, if He had not become the sin offering, which act, which uh, his sacrifice inaugurated the new covenant, if he hadn't become the sin offering, there would be no eternal inheritance because the essential basis of all divine forgiveness, including the forgiveness that's available under the shadows of the old covenant, wouldn't have occurred. He is the basis of all divine forgiveness. So if he had not have come, if he hadn't have been sacrificed, there would be no forgiveness. Okay, so this is what he's talking about. Put differently, the forgiveness of the old covenant, it required the coming of the new covenant because it required the son's efficacious sacrifice. He is forgiving sins here on the basis of the coming of Christ. If he doesn't come, there's no basis for forgiveness. Then or any time. And since, so that is, forgiveness is necessary to receive the promised eternal inheritance. You get the same kind of idea in Romans chapter 3, verses 24 through 26, where Paul's talking about this idea, about how these sins under the old covenant. Uh, you know, it is Christ who was there. Let me read to you what Donald Hagner says in his commentary. He says, the real answer to sins against the commandments of the Mosaic law is found not in the sacrifice of animals, but in the sacrifice of Christ. The new covenant thus contains within it the answer to the failure to abide by the requirements of the old covenant. And forgiveness experienced during the OT period depended finally, although this was hardly understood at the time, upon an event that was to take place in the future. 
The sacrifice of Christ is the answer to sin in every era, past and present, since it alone is the means of forgiveness. You see, so you have God here, you have this forgiveness on the basis of a shadow, but it is underwritten. It is underwritten by the atoning sacrifice of Christ, which is the only atoning sacrifice. These things are shadows. Okay, these things are shadows. Now, verses 16 and 17... Verses 16 and 17 here, they emphasize the link between Christ's death and the establishment of the new covenant. Okay, and the way he does this, the writer does this by analogizing, he analogizes the covenant to a will. Okay, which analogy is invited by the mention of of inheritance at the end of verse 15. Okay, it's invited. This analogy is invited because he mentions inheritance at the end of verse 15. And what do you think with inheritance? Well, you're thinking will. Okay, so you have the mention of that, but it's also invited by the fact that the Greek word diatheke means both covenant and will. It's the same word. Okay, so you can see how the analogy is invited, and I am with the majority of commentators who see here a shift in meaning, kind of a play on the word, in a shift from the meaning of covenant to the meaning of will. Okay, 10 of the 12 people I read on the subject see it that way. All right, so th- I think I'm in good company. I think that this is, this is, you know, this is what's going on. There's a shift in the meaning here, and, and the result is what his point is that as a death is necessary for a will to become operational. Okay, it doesn't kick into effect and take force until you have the death, and then it's administered and the stuff gets doled out basic, on the basis of the will. Okay, so as a death is necessary for a will to become operational, so a death was necessary for the new covenant to take effect. He is emphasizing the role of Christ's death in the establishment of the new covenant. Okay, and then he says in the next couple of verses, 18 through 22, he says, Therefore, not even the first covenant was instituted without blood. For when every command of the law had been spoken to all the people by Moses... He took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood the tabernacle and also all the vessels of the ministry. Indeed, according to the law, nearly everything is purified by blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Okay, in verses 18 through 20, They show how this was true, uh, even of the first covenant. Okay, this idea, he says, a death was necessary for the new covenant to take effect. And then in verses 18 to 20, he shows, look, this was new even of the first, this was necessary even for the first covenant. That a death was involved in the institution of the first covenant. Given the necessity of a death for the operation of a will, which is analogous to a covenant, Not even the first covenant took effect without a death. And then he appeals to Exodus chapter 24, verse 3 through 8, which show that the covenant there, the first covenant, the Mosaic covenant, it was instituted with the blood of a sacrifice. Okay, so what's he? He's saying that Christ's death, he's emphasizing he brought in the new covenant, and now he's making this argument off the analogy between a will, a covenant and a will. He says the will doesn't take effect without a death. And based on that analogy, you see even the first covenant, the Mosaic covenant, didn't take effect without a, without a death. And he's talking about Exodus 20, 24, verse 3 through 8, where you see that there was the blood of a sacrifice involved in the institution of that covenant. Now, just as a footnote here, I bracket the words here and the goats because they're probably not in the original text of Hebrews. Okay, that's why they're omitted in the New International Version the Revised English Bible, today's New International Version. They're not present in the, in the oldest uh, manuscript we have of Hebrews, which is, well, I won't tell you what it is, but uh, it's the oldest one we have. Okay, so uh, it's not there. Uh, but, so I just bracketed that, but some, some translations still continue to, to have it. Now here, the Hebrew writer, this is interesting to me anyway, he reveals some details about the institution of the Old Covenant in Exodus 24 that aren't reported in Exodus 24. Okay, specifically he refers to this, he he notes that water, scarlet, wool, and hyssop uh, 
were involved in the sprinkling and that the book of the covenant that Moses had read from, that it was sprinkled in addition to the people. Okay, well, th th those facts aren't in Exodus 24. So what apparently is going on here, presumably his audience w was familiar with these additional details by way of tradition. There had been an extra biblical tradition, presumably, because he's writing to them like they know these things. And that the Spirit of God, through the writer of Hebrews, is now saying that, yes, that tradition is factual. So he's telling them that that's how this occurred. That you had these extra details, you have this sprinkling with the, with the water, the scarlet wool and the hyssop, and you have both the, uh, the book from which Moses read and the people sprinkled. Then verse, verse 21, he focuses on the cleansing effect of the blood and the later dedication of the tabernacle. Okay, that wasn't right at the institution of the covenant. He doesn't say it is. It's at the later dedication of the tabernacle. He focuses here on the cleansing effect that blood had there. And it's not clear, okay, when Moses sprinkled the tabernacle and the vessels with blood. Presumably, it happened in Exodus chapter, chapter 40 where the Lord tells Moses, he tells him, he says, take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it and consecrate it. Okay, take the anointing oil and anoint it and all that's in it and consecrate it and all its furniture so that it may become holy. Well, he was told at the same time to anoint and to consecrate Aaron that he might serve the Lord as a priest. And then we, when we see in Leviticus chapter 8 the anointing and the consecration of Aaron, it involves both the sprinkling of oil and blood. Okay, so what happens is it looks like the inference is is that when he says anoint and consecrate, we know in Aaron's case that involved the sprinkling of oil and blood, so it looks like on the tabernacle it involved oil and blood. And that looks to be the inference that is drawn from. Let me read to you what uh, Bruce says, F.F. F. Bruce. He says, but as Aaron and his sons were hallowed with the blood of the ram of consecration as well as with the oil of anointing, when they were installed in their sacred office, in Leviticus chapter 8, verse 23 and following in verse 30, it might be inferred that the tabernacle and its furnishings, which were hallowed at the same time, were sprinkled with the blood in addition to being anointed with the oil. I'm saying this because if you scratch your head and you say, well, when was the tabernacle anointed with blood? Okay, I'm saying this is apparently the inference that was drawn, and we know that this inference was out there because Josephus, uh, it was a current understanding, he, he, he said, Josephus said that the Moses purified the tabernacle and its vessels both with oil and with the blood of bulls and rams. So he had drawn that inference. Somehow within the stream of Judaism, they had, drawn, they had read this text that way, had drawn that inference. And again, here the Spirit is saying, through the inspired writer of Hebrews, that understanding is correct. Okay? So I, some of these details you may not care about. They're just things that strike me. And so I want to tell you something that I've seen about it. So that when you, if it does strike, you'll go, okay, uh, you know, I, I think there's, there's some way to make sense of this. The bottom line is given in verse 22. Okay, the bottom line here, he says, indeed, according to the law, nearly everything is purified by blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The purifying effect of sacrificial blood is all over the Old Testament, and it's central to divine forgiveness. You can look in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, for example. It's all over it, okay? And that's the bottom line. And then he says, therefore, verse 23, chapter 9, verse 23, therefore it was a necessity that the copies of the things in the heavens be purified with these things, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter into a sanctuary made by hands, a representation of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear before the face of God on our behalf. He says, look, given that the purifying effect of, given this purifying effect of blood, that's all over the Old Testament. Okay, given that purifying effect, it was necessary for the earthly tabernacle and the vessels to be purified with animal sacrifices, but purifying the heavenly sanctuary required something better. That would work, that was sufficient for purifying the earthly tabernacle, but the heavenly sanctuary required something better. He says, look, just as the high priest on the Day of Atonement, okay, the high priest on the Day of Atonement, he sprinkled blood on front of, uh, on and in front of the ark cover, 
to make atonement for the Holy of Holies. You see, you can see that in Leviticus 16, 15 through 19. He makes atonement for the Holy of Holies. Well, why? Because of the defiling effect of the Israelites' uncleanness. You see, this is the place where God is interacting with man, and so it needs to be atoned for. Why? Because of the Israelites' uncleanness. Okay, so it's atoned for, and then it, then it makes that space fit. Makes that fit space suitable for continuing interaction between God and his people. Okay, just as that was the case with regard to the earthly tabernacle, okay, with the Holy of Holies there, so access to God's heavenly presence was opened by Christ's supremely efficacious sacrifice for sins. So again, do you see he's saying the reality, the superior, the better, the true, the real, the shadow, the lesser. And you're thinking about going to that. Why would you do that? And the only reason I can think somebody would do that is they have not grasped what we're talking about when we're talking about Jesus Christ. They haven't seen it. They think it's the Rotary Club. They think it's something where we hobnob and we're friendly to each other and can help each other out. And haven't seen that we are a redeemed community of people, rescued, saved, carried out by Jesus Christ. And if we can get people to see it, I'm just convinced if we can get them to see it, it'll be like, whoa! See, that's what holds people. And everything else, all these other things that we, we use to try to get people to stay in the building, I want them to stay here. That's what I want. I want them to stay in their heart and mind and soul. I want them to be in love with Christ, surrendered to Him, rejoicing in what He has done for us, what He continues to do, who He is, where He is, what He's doing. I want their heart there. The fact they come to the building, I like that. You see, I like that, but that just needs to be an overflow of the truth that I have seen who Jesus is, and I'm his. I'm his. What else can I do? Because I've seen the master. I've seen who Jesus Christ is. Okay, he says he appeared on our behalf in heaven itself, paving the way for us to enter into God's presence. You see that in chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. Let me read to you what uh, uh, Guthrie says. He, he Says, makes a comment about the, something in Attridge's commentary. He says, Attridge makes the important observation that the Day of Atonement analogy breaks down at this point. Our author says nothing about Christ sprinkling the blood in the heavenly realm since he does not wish to speak of the heavenly offering as separate from his death on the cross. They are one and the same. You see, that is the offering that Christ makes. That's his sacrifice. And so he doesn't carry the analogy to the point of him taking some literal blood into the, into the heavenly place because his sacrifice is his crucifixion. See, that's his sacrifice. Okay, he says in 25 through 28, he says, nor was it so that he would offer himself repeatedly like the high priest who enters into the sanctuary with blood belonging to another. For then it would have been necessary for him to suffer repeatedly from the foundation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages for removal of sins through the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is destined for men to die once and after this judgment, so also Christ, having been offered up once in order to bear the sins of many, will appear for a second time for those who are eagerly waiting for him without relation to sin, but for salvation. Okay? He says here, look, Christ's entrance into the heavenly sanctuary was not to offer himself repeatedly as in the earthly ritual of the Day of Atonement. Okay, this was something that would go on every year. The high priest entered into the Holy, Holy of Holies each year, year after year after year. With the blood of animals, he says, Christ, his entrance into the heavenly sanctuary wasn't to offer himself repeatedly like the earthly ritual of the Day of Atonement. See, because if that were true, in that case, he, being eternally existent, if that were the case, see, then he would have had to die repeatedly from the foundation of the world, which obviously hasn't happened. 
You see, he'd have to die again and come and die again and die and die and die and die. And he said, that obviously hasn't happened. See, so that's not what's going on. Rather, he appeared at one time in history. Christ appeared at one time in history in the first century to provide forgiveness for all sinners through the sacrifice of himself. A one-time event. The greatest event in the history of creation is the coming and crucifixion of Jesus Christ. His atoning sacrifice. That is the greatest thing. And when I think about what we as people spend all of our time studying and thinking about, particularly in schools, you know, what is the most important thing and all that? This is the most important thing. This. His sacrifice is the most important. Guthrie remarks, he says, his sacrifice because of its superior quality, is able to reach back to the time of creation and forward to the time of the consummation of the ages, fully cleansing the people of God. Absolutely, completely efficacious. From the foundation to the consummation, His blood is able to do it. His sacrifice fulfills that. Christ appeared at the end of the ages, He says. Well, at the end of the ages, in the sense, see, his appearance marked the arrival of the last days, the inauguration of the final stage of redemptive history. Okay, that's, that's what has happened with Christ. I said regarding uh, chapter one, uh, Hebrews 1, verse 2, that Jesus' coming, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, and the pouring out of the Spirit, that complex of events, that was the beginning of the last days. For example, in Peter, in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, he refers to the outpouring of the Spirit as an event of the last days. Okay, we're in the last days. Christ's coming, resurrection, ascension, all of these things mark the last days. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, Paul, he describes, he tells how people will be in the last days. You know, they're going to be this, lovers of themselves and all those kinds of things. And then he tells Timothy, You stay away from such people. They're going to be this way in the last days. You stay away from them. Well, how's he going to stay away from them? Because we're in the last days. You see, you can see this elsewhere too. James 5, 3, 2 Peter 3, verse 3. Let me read to you. I have a a couple of quotes here that I like on this concept I want to give to you. I've probably shared these with you before in different classes. But here's Douglas Moo. He's a New Testament scholar. He writes this in his commentary on the book of James. He says... With the death and resurrection of Jesus and pouring out of the Spirit, the last days have been inaugurated. This final age of salvation will find its climax in the return of Christ in glory. But, and here's the crucial point, the length of the age is unknown. Not even Jesus knew how long the last days would last. What this means is that the return of Christ as the next event in the salvation historical timetable is from the time of the early church to our own day near or imminent. Every generation of Christians lives or should live okay, with the consciousness that the parousia, the return of Christ, could occur at any time and that one needs to make decisions and choose values based on that realization. You and I as Christians are to live in that realization. See, we are to live that way. That Jesus Christ is at the door. Okay, he's a John Stott puts it this way, if I can get him to come up here in his commentary on Romans. He says, what the apostles did know is that the kingdom of God came with Jesus, that the decisive salvation events which established it, his death, resurrection, exaltation, and gift of the Spirit, had already taken place, and that God had nothing on his calendar before the parousia. It would be the next and culminating event. So they were and we are living in the last days. It is in this sense that Christ is coming soon. We must be watchful and alert because we do not know the time. Okay, so he talks about here this idea where he says that, uh, he, says that he's, he's, he appeared at the end of the ages. And that is the sense in which he means that. And then he says, verses 27 and 28 of this section that we read, He compares Christ's death to that of ordinary humans. Okay, and then he asserts that it's both similar to and different from the common pattern. Okay, it's similar to, like other people, Christ died once. Okay, but unlike other people who after death face judgment, Christ, after his death, he returns 
to bring salvation from judgment. You see, so he's both like and unlike. He died once, as people die once, but they die once, and after that, the judgment. He died once, and then returns to bring salvation, which is the freedom from the negative judgment. Okay, and we wait for Christ to return. Then he says in chapter 10, you see, we're moving, aren't we? He says, for the law, being a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the very form of the things is never able by the same sacrifices which they offer continuously every year to perfect those who approach. For otherwise would they not have ceased being offered since the worshipers having been cleansed once for all would no longer have consciousness of sins? But in them there is a reminder of sins every year for it is impossible for blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Okay, the, the annual sacrifices on the Day of Atonement. Okay, these annual sacrifices prescribed by the law of Moses were unable to perfect the people in the sense that he's already mentioned in chapter 9, verse 9. They were unable to perfect them with regard to the conscience. See, unable to perfect them with regard to the conscience, unable to resolve fully one sense of guilt. Okay, because there was an intuitive awareness of their inherent inadequacy for atonement. There was some sense that people had that my sins aren't redeemed, aren't atoned for by this dumb animal. Okay, so God accommodates them and says, I will restore fellowship formally, externally, but the conscience wasn't cleansed. There was this sense, there was this lingering sense of guilt that continued as a barrier to intimacy. Okay, so he says he couldn't perfect them. There was this nagging sense of guilt. That was an impediment to intimacy with God. The law's sacrificial system, it was only a shadow. Okay, why was it? Because it was only a shadow of the real substance, you see. A shadow of the true sacrifice, the efficacious sacrifice, the effective sacrifice that it represented. It was a shadow of the sacrifice of Christ that has now taken place in history. It was simply, the, it pointed to it. It was a shadow of it. The sacrifice and the good things connected to it. They were in the future when the law of Moses was given. He says the law was a shadow of the good things that are coming. Well, they were coming when the law of Moses was given, but as the writer has made clear, those good things, he makes clear in chapter 9, verse 11, those good things to come, they have now come in Christ. Right? They're now. They're here. Victor Fitzner, he writes in his commentary, he says, the good things to which the law pointed, like the cult upon which it was based, have become a reality. Chapter 9, verse 11. They are the better things that belong to salvation, a better covenant based on better promises and sacrifices. They are the true form in which God's will finds expression. That is the substance. That is the reality. They were the shadows. And the, re and the substance has now become the reality. It has arrived in Christ. If the sacrifices of the law, if they had been the genuine basis for atonement for sins rather than simply a shadow, see, of the genuine basis for atonement, there would be no need for them to, be, to have been repeated annually. If they had been the substance instead of a shadow, there would have been no need for them to be repeated annually because the first time would have been sufficient to get the job done. Okay, now he simply asserts this. He assumes this. He doesn't go out and explain it. But he clearly makes the assumption is that the substance, the true sacrifice is perpetually effective and thus requires no repetition. That's it. He just takes that for granted. And so he says, look, if these things were the substance on the basis of that assumption, if these things were the substance, they wouldn't need to keep being repeated. Because the substance, the true sacrifice, is, is good enough to get the job done. It's a one-time deal and cleanses forever. Okay, so that's what he's talking about there. Now, the fact of the matter is that it's impossible. It's impossible for the blood of animals to be the actual basis for divine forgiveness. They do not have atoning efficacy. Okay, they don't have atoning. He's making this clear. Atoning efficacy is in the death of Jesus Christ, God incarnate. That is where the atonement for sin lies. Animals don't have atoning efficacy, their sacrifice. 
Rather, see, the offering of them is merely the occasion. The occasion for forg- when forgiveness was granted under the old covenant on the basis of Christ's coming sacrifice. That's why I put it, they were forgiven on credit, so to speak. All of that forgiveness, all forgiveness anywhere of, from God is underwritten by the atoning death of Jesus Christ. He is that significant. Do you see? He's that significant. He's everything. Absolutely everything. And then you hear people talk about him. You hear them talk about him like he's a joke or a dog or something. And he here is the atonement of mankind. And we all ought to fall down and just say, praise you, Jesus. But how does the world treat him and talk about him? And it's a tribute. It's a tribute. I hear these atheists debating and, you know, being snotty toward God and all this stuff. And I said, you better be thankful that the God we serve is as merciful as he is. Well, if God's so big, why didn't he this and that? Because he's merciful and you better be thankful. Because if you don't think he could smoke you in a heartbeat, he could. He could. Okay, he is, this, he is the center of everything. And because these things are shadows that lack atoning efficacy, animal sacrifices are inadequate to deal finally and fully with one's conscience, one's sense of guilt. And thus, see, because of that, their repeated offering, see, it, it becomes a reminder of sins. They're inadequate to deal fully and finally with one's sense of guilt, so offering them again and again is a reminder of sins rather than an ultimate cleansing. They don't have the ability to be an ultimate cleansing because they're shadows. And so when you repeat them and repeat them and repeat them, what do you do? You're just reminding me of sin. But Christ is the reality. He is the substance. Verse 5, chapter 10, verse 5, he says, Therefore, when entering into the world... He says, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but you prepared a body for me. Get this, when entering into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but you prepared a body for me. You did not take pleasure in burnt offerings and offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come. It has been written about me in the scroll of the book to do your will, O God. Saying first that sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, which are offered according to the law, you did not desire or take pleasure in. Then he said, look, I've come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second by which, we will, by which will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Okay, he says, look, because the sacrificial system of the law, okay, because that was, it was a shadow that lacked atoning efficacy, okay? It was a, because it was a shadow that lacked atoning efficacy, efficacy Christ entered into the human world uh, in the incarnation, speaking the words of Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8, or in the, the Septuagint versification of Psalm 39, verses 6 through 8, but he speaks these words to God the Father as he embarked from heavenly glory. I just find this amazing. See, here he is in the incarnation and he's saying this to the Father. And the point of the quotation from the psalm is that though God through the law prescribed the offerings for sin, those offerings were never the fulfillment of his purpose. They were never what he desired in a final, ultimate sense. Yes, he prescribed them, but they were doing something else. They were never, see, they were never uh, the fulfillment of his purpose. What he desired in a final, ultimate sense, rather his ultimate intention, was the complete and perfect forgiveness provided through Christ's obedient offering of his own body and sacrifice. See, the shadows were unsatisfactory. They were insufficient in the sense or because they weren't the substance. They weren't the substance. So they were insufficient. So Christ, God prescribed these things, but he says they weren't the ultimate fulfillment of your intention and purpose. That's not what it was about. In accomplishing his ultimate purpose in Christ, God supplanted the old covenant sacrificial system with the true sacrifice of Christ. In the words of the second part of verse 9, he took away the first to establish the second. And as a result of 
that divine will. We have been sanctified through the offering of Jesus' body once for all, praise God. You see, because of that divine will, we have been sanctified once for all. So here he says, listen, I'm coming. You've prepared this body, sacrifice and all, but you prepared a body for me. I'm coming in the incarnation to be the substance, to be the true atoning sacrifice. I'm coming to die for the sins of mankind. And yes, there were these offerings, but those things weren't your ultimate intent and purpose and will. Your ultimate intent was the kind of total, utter purification that my death will provide. And that's what he's doing. And I just think when I read these things, I just, it's like, you know, to even hold the book that's saying this. It's just wild. It's just wild. Okay, let me go on here, and then we got just uh, two minutes, but I can say a lot in two minutes. Okay, it says in, in verse 11 through 14, And every priest stands day after day, ministering and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which never are able to take away sins. But this one, having offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those being sanctified. See, unlike the old covenant priests, he's, he's contrasting Christ's priestly activity to that of the Levitical priests. And unlike the old covenant priest, see, whose ministry, it has a perpetually unfinished character to it. Right? A perpetually unfinished character to it. They stand day after day and offer repeatedly the shadow sacrifices that lack true efficacy. So they, you know, they're doing this all the time, repeatedly. Because they're offering these sacrifices that lack true efficacy. Unlike that, Jesus, he sat down at the right hand of God offering himself. See, offering himself as the one time supremely efficacious sacrifice for sin. So here they are with this perpetually unfinished character to what they're doing. Jesus, one time, offered himself. The top deal, the substance, the form, the reality. Christ has come and died. And so unlike this perpetually unfinished thing, it is finished. And by that one offering, he's perfected for all time those who come to God through him. Then having completed his sacrificial offering, Jesus, he's at the right hand of the Father doing what? Interceding for us. Interceding for us, as we see in chapter 7, verse 25, and chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. Lane says, although no priest of Aaron's line ever sat down and sat down in the presence of God in the earthly sanctuary... Christ has done so in the heavenly sanctuary. And Christ, he tells us, he will remain in the heavenly realm until his second coming. Referred to in chapter 9, verse 28. See, at which time, see, the kingdom he inaugurated at his first coming will be consummated. And I've said this many times, you never know what sinks in or what gets rejected. But here he said, look, the kingdom of God is inaugurated with Christ coming, but we live in an overlap of ages because the kingdom is not the sole reality. You and I share in it. We are participants in it. But there is a time coming. There is a time now when God, by his purpose, allows this rebellion to go on. All of these things that are inconsistent with God's eternal purpose, death, suffering, all of those things, he allows them to go on contrary to his rule. But a time is coming when Jesus will return, consummate the kingdom, and the last enemy is going to be gone. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And that happens in the general resurrection when Jesus comes. And then we'll have the eternal state. New heaven and new earth. Resurrected bodies living perfectly there. Complete love and harmony. It is a reality like none other. And I'm not ashamed to talk about it. It is glorious. And my heart is set on it. Because if you've been in times where there have been great fellowship and loving and holding people, singing just how wonderful it is, that's going to be the rest of your life for eternity. Thank you for coming.